Emma, I just made you a co-host. So if there's anyone who wants to join the room, just let them in. I will not be able to focus because I will be focusing on our very special guest, uh, John Bates. John, I don't know how to... Uh, we met a couple of years or some years ago here in Bratislava. You were yes. one of our uh, keynote speakers, a headliner in our conference. Uh, you are a, a, a public speaker. You are a, a coach. You are a consultant uh i don't know how to introduce you what's your why that's a great way to introduce me my why is to bring out what's awesome inside every person so they can have the impact they want to have in the world excellent and we will be talking about this we will be talking about what you are doing what what's your occupation or, or profession because we have students here who are at the beginning of their careers and yeah. they would like to make up their minds and they need to learn about everything they they, they need to yeah. learn more about what you are doing how you are doing it uh so basically what's the main part of of your focus what 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 do you do the most so I'm I'm uh I'm what I guess people call a leadership communication expert and I work uh, the thing that I've been doing the very most over the past especially 2 years is supporting uh high level leaders in their leadership communication. So everything from how they communicate one on one with their direct reports to how they communicate when they're on stage giving a TED like talk or talking to the press or things like that. And a lot of what I bring in that is um, strategic messaging. But even more than that is I, I bring people the neurobiology of effective communication so they can understand not only what works but also why it works based in science, which makes people vastly more effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, to all of the students, just feel free to, to ask, unmute yourselves and ask questions or uh, send us a question via chat or, or, or raise your hand, whatever makes, wh whatever works for you. Uh, John, just to make it a little bit more tangible. Let's let's imagine yep. that uh, there is a CEO or a, a, a business person who is to uh, deliver a, a, a TED talk. And they that's, approach that's you. That's a perfect example, yeah. And, and, and they need your help. So what do you do? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I started with the TED format over 10 years ago because I blew my first chance on the TED stage. I mean, I gave a talk and it was a disaster. And it wasn't on the main stage at TED, but it was on a side stage at the TED conference. So, and, so uh, 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 I was- uh, John, where, when you're saying TED, you mean the original one, not the TEDx, but the original TED So uh, Yeah, no, I mean top level TED, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. a TEDx. I've spoken mm -hmm. at a lot of TEDx events since then, and I've spoken at TED a number of times after that, luckily. But that mm -hmm. first time at the real actual TED conference, I freaking blew it. And uh, and I wrote an article at Inc.com about it. So if you write John Bates, TED fail, that'll probably be the first result. And uh, I talk about why I failed so badly, but that gave me real motivation to get good at the TED format because I'd been so impressed by it and realized I was not doing it. So I started studying that TED format. Now, for most of my life, I was a chief evangelist for different tech companies that I had co-founded or founded or was an early stage employee at. So that was my whole uh, career to that point for most of my life since 1994. I was the chief evangelist. I raised several hundred million dollars in Silicon Valley and beyond. Now, I have to be honest, especially with you guys, because of where you are and what you're here to learn. I have never had a successful exit yet, but I raised several hundred million dollars. All those companies failed. So, you know. Uh, get ready for failure. It may be part of your life, you know, especially if you're trying big things. Uh, 
And so then I got to Ted and I was like, wow, this is on, this is so powerful. And I wanted to understand that. So I've dedicated a huge chunk of my life over the past decade plus to understanding the TED format. So I'm one of the most prolific coaches in the TED format in the world. And I've never worked for TED, but I know them, they know me, we love each other. But I've got now after a decade, my own take on the TED like talk. And that's usually how I get brought in, Lukash, is uh -huh. I get brought in because an executive, they want their executives at the this year's summit, global summit, to give TED-like talks. So I come in and help them give TED-like talks. Uh -huh. uh, John, you mentioned the very first speech that you delivered for, for the, the real TED, the original TED. Uh, and, and you said it was a, not really a success. Uh, <laughs> That's a nice way to say do, it. Do, do, do you still remember the topic? What was it about? Yeah, of course I remember the topic. And here's the problem. The talk was fundamentally, I'll tell you more, but I'll start out by saying the talk was fundamentally about me. Because I was making the mistake of trying to use that TED-like talk to establish myself as an expert in the world of online gaming and early, early NFTs, that kind of world. So I felt like I was on the cutting edge of something that was really going to turn into something big. And it certainly has. But I tried to use that talk to impress people and make them think I was brilliant instead of bringing them one really useful idea we're spreading and it was a it was an abject failure so, so ob obviously yeah. obviously this is also a warning to all of us <laughs> not to overwhelm yes. the audience with too many messages well you know what there were a few mistakes i made the number one mistake was that i may i i instead of being up on stage for the audience to be of service just I was up on stage to serve myself. That never works. That will never work. Do not do, don't get up on stage at a TED or TEDx event or any event and try to sell your book, right? Get up and give people something super useful and they'll all want to buy your book. It's, it's like it works backwards from how we expect, right? So that's one. The second one is that I learned, I knew better. I knew this, but I forgot. When you cram your information in, you cram your audience out. TED Talks are really short. So instead of boiling it down to like one key thing, I tried to cram in like five or 10. And nobody got anything. Much better if I'd focused on one thing and landed it than try to get 10 things in and land none of them. So, so obviously, obviously you, you learned it hard way and <laughs> let, let, let's, let's get back. Let's get back to that CEO who approaches you and yeah. needs to improve his or her uh, speech. What do you, what do you do? How do you approach it? You know, so the first thing is that uh, the only way that I really get these things is usually by referral. So typically they'll come to me because somebody else told them, John's great, you got to work with them. So they're ready to listen, you know, uh, which is helpful. Because um, if they're not ready to listen, then we got to start someplace else. But, uh, but let's say they're ready to listen. So I've got, so first of all, I've got an online uh, boot camp that is uh, about three and a half hours of all my most important content. And I'll share a little bit of that with you guys if you want. But so I asked them, okay, what do you want to do? What are you up to? I get their world. I understand what, what, you know, okay, I've got two months and I've got to give this huge presentation to, you know, everybody that cares about the company. We're having this big summit and I'm going to be giving a, a keynote there, right? As the CEO. And I say, okay, great. Uh, good. So first thing is they do my online course. And that course has all of the key elements that I think are the most important things in, in the whole world for them to know. 
-hmm. And once they do that course, we now have a shared vocabulary. And by the way, it took me, I mean, almost five years to get to an understanding of what needed to go in that course. So, you know, I think people are like, oh, I'll just build a course. You know, what should I build it about? <laughs> okay, well, you know, I built my course about something that I'd been doing for a lifetime, you know. So I built so, so, I, so ba ba basic, basically, you are saying that five years of work distilled into what three hours of online workshopping yeah, yeah, yeah. and working. Yeah. And, you know, and if you, yeah, and if you want to say it that way, it, I started public speaking in high school at, you know, in, in, as a freshman in high school. So everything I learned from the time I was a freshman in high school till I did that course, that's, you know, I mean, God, that's more time than I want to admit, <sighs> right? That's like 40 years of learning. Then I spent five years coaching that stuff figuring out what worked, what didn't, didn't, what was necessary, and then put it into a course. Now, you don't have to take that long, but I just want you to understand if you're, if you think you're going to go out and be a course creator and teach people stuff, it's going to work better if it's something you've lived for a while and you've taught for a while and you've got experience with, you know, and that's just part of life. I used to hate that people that like job descriptions would say experience required. I'm like, oh, God, I could do it better than those people with experience. Well, experience does actually end up counting for something. It's not the only thing. <laughs> but so, yeah, so on that's- the, what, On yeah. the other hand, on the other hand, this is not very encouraging for st students because every time they apply for a job, everyone expects 10, 10 years of experience, but a, a, a fresh exactly. grad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. We were discussing that also many times. It's sometimes very hard because you know you have to start somewhere and even yes. though even if you are very kind of prone to trying and open to trying and want to it's still hard even for people that want to do that <laughs> yeah so, but yeah well and, you know yeah all right go ahead Emma. i wanted to ask you because you said that you started in high school um yeah. has there been something that you thought in high school like this is the you know, this is the truth that I carry in me. And throughout that lifetime, I'm sure there is something. Has there been like a change, like a major change that now you look back and you think, okay, maybe maybe what I thought back then is not completely, you know, or you see it differently now. So when I went to high school from junior high school, my best friend, Jeff Curris and I, took forensics and we didn't even know what forensics really was, but the most beautiful girl in junior high school, Joni Babalus took forensics and we wanted to follow her because she, we both were name. in love. Right. <laughs> so we fit, we finally found out forensics is public speaking and debate. So it was completely on some hand random that I took that course it was also random that I had a, a really fabulous teacher in there. Not everybody's that lucky. He was one of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And I thought he, he was super cool. So I did anything he said. So I got very good because I had a great coach and I was coachable, right? Not much to do with me. It's because I just did anything he said. Mm -hmm. Now, I had no, I'm one of those people who had no freaking idea what I was going to do. And my whole life, I just kind of bounced from thing to thing. And I was always very enthusiastic and excited about what I was doing, but I had no idea. I'm not one of those people like my best friend who he was going to be a doctor. And that was that. And he just became a doctor. Now he's a doctor. He's very successful. And it was just, Mrah. I was like, you know, and I didn't even find what I want to do, what I, I didn't find what I'm doing now, which I think is why I'm put on earth until probably about 12 years ago, you know, 10 years ago. And uh, so for that whole time, I was just, I think one takeaway from that is that if, you know, even if you don't know where you're going, do whatever you decide to do at the absolute best you can do everything the best you can. And sooner or later, I think you'll end up in that place you're supposed to be. And you will have really built those skills, whatever they are. 
And these weird side things that you didn't think would ever matter, I think all of a sudden become key and important. So, so you know, if they require experience, don't let that stop you from saying, hey, I think I could do this. I don't have any experience. If you really need experience for this job, is there another job where I could start with no experience, but a lot of enthusiasm, right? Because yeah. like everything, everything is malleable. Everything is stretchable and moldable and bendable and changeable. You just have to be willing to try and ask. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Mario would like to ask. Yeah, have you tried getting in touch once again with this girl and be like, oh, I built a fucking <laughs> career out of this thing? You know, I, I, I'm still in touch with her and I think she knows, but I should find her. I, I should send her an email. But what I did do, Mario, is I came back to Salt Lake City and I found that debate coach. And he was very old and he had just lost his wife to a, a complication from surgery, which was just heartbreaking. And, uh, and I got to tell him how much I loved him and what an enormous impact he had had in those four years on the entire rest of my life. And, and then uh, he moved somewhere because as I said, his wife had just died. I lost touch with him and I just saw about four or five months ago in the newspaper that he had died. And I got to tell you, I'm so, it's going to make me cry right now. I'm so glad that I've, I've had to fight so hard to find that guy. And I don't even know if it mattered nearly as much to him as it mattered to me, but I'm so glad I got to tell him. Thank you. So, Lukash, I think I kind of got sidetracked from your original question. Yes, obviously, I repeat myself again and again, but I would like to get back to that uh, imaginary CEO who approaches yeah. you. Well, first yeah. of all, you mentioned that he would uh, or, or she would uh, join your online course. And yep. then after, what, what, what comes next? What do you do then? Then we then I, I will sit down and we'll talk about what do you want to say? You know, what do you think your message is going to be? And one of the interesting exercises I learned from Ted that I bring everywhere now is what is your one idea worth spreading? Because if you've only got less than 20 minutes, you can't get three or four or five or your top three or whatever. Those That short of a talk requires one idea, the focus of that. So I'll get them focused on their one idea worth spreading. And then one of the other big, big things, Lukash, that I'll, I'll share with you that they get out of my course, but that we talk about again, because it's so important. And this will make a difference for anyone who listens and takes it on right now for the rest of your life. I tell them in the course and in our first meeting, okay, communicating with human beings is not logical. Did you notice? <laughs> it's not logical. It's biological. And when you understand the biology, you can make it logical again. But anyone who goes into anything like a speech or a pitch or any kind of communication with human beings, anyone who goes in thinking logic by itself should win. I mean, maybe it should, but that doesn't change the real world. In the real world, logic by itself is necessary it has to make sense. It has to be logically sound, but it's not sufficient. Logic by itself is not enough. We must make an emotional connection or we get yes, 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 no. Have you ever had that in your life? Trying to sell something, trying to talk someone into doing something. Yes, we like it. Yes, it's priced right. Yes, uh, it would make a difference. No, we're not ready yet. <laughs> right? Yes, 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 no. Look what that is. That's logic, 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 emotion. Yes, 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 no. The, that means we didn't make an emotional connection. So I'm always working with my clients, day one, moment one, all the time, forever, on how are you going to make an emotional connection? Because until you make an emotional connection, all the logic in the world just bounces right off. You get yes, 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 no. 
right? And that's because the logical brain is actually wrapped around the outside of the emotional ancient brain. So the logical brain to get someone to take action has to go through the emotional part of the brain. So if we don't make an emotional connection, boing, the logic can't, can't get through. Does that make how, sense? How, how actually, do, how I, was they... gonna, yep. I was yep. going to ask, actually, um, <laughs> this is this is something that is um, I have I've noticed a lot, you know, when I talk to someone and then like they agree with me and then like we're like, OK, let's do this. And they're like, um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the exact same thing. It's very really interesting. Um, and I'm actually wondering how how then do you what are some of the things like is it like stories like personal stories that help you know people connect like emotionally or like yes. what what are the kinds of things that that help so that you know what the thing that I work on with every CEO Lukash and Greta is uh, their origin story because I think it's one of your most powerful leadership stories in the world. Why do you care so much about what you are doing and what you're up to in the world, right? And, uh, you know, that story, once we, so I like to say well-chosen, well-crafted, well-told. Well-chosen, well-crafted, well-told uh, st origin story. So, you know, Lukas, you are, you're an educator at least part of the time, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. weren't, weren't you somehow doing this all your life already anyway like from yes, when you were a little yes. kid <laughs> obviously from from the very beginning and right? there's, there's there's a tradition my my father is a professor a, a university professor my grandfather was and i was very very opposed when I was a teenager, I, I was like, no way, this is not going to be <laughs> what I will I, I would do in my life. And somehow it was stronger than the logic inside. Yeah. So what was that moment when you were a teenager one day and you're like, I'm never going to do this. And then something happened and you went, OK, OK, this actually is what I'm going to do. It's hard to say. It's like the flywheel effect. You, you, you push a little bit, then again, then again, and, and suddenly it starts rolling faster and faster. So I, I, I don't know whether I can pinpoint one situation that changed the perspective. It just happened right. step by step, I would say. Right. So, so here you are mentally saying, I'm never going to be a teacher. I'm never going to be a professor. I've seen that. I'm not going to do it. Meanwhile, the entire time you're walking right in the door. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. Because what really matters to you is making a difference for people through education. And, and you've seen the difference that an education makes. You've seen the difference your grandfather and your father made. Mm. And I got to imagine you're inspired by making that kind of a difference, inspired enough to get over your inner teenager. Right. And uh, obviously it was a craving to, let's say, improve the world. And sooner or later, you figure out that, that the best way. For, for me, of course, the best way for me yes. to improve the world is by inspiring others or helping others grow or, or, or teaching or coaching or whatever you call it. So you did it. OK, now, those of you that have been with Lukas, did you know that story? No. OK, does it does it make you fall in love even more? Doesn't it make total <laughs> sense? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you go, right? <laughs> That's how this works. And when you choose, you know, when you identify and choose a good story and then you craft it well and tell it well, and you make sure that you just let people know that story up front, every, it's like a red carpet rolling out in front of you. People just want to be on board with you. They want to help. They want to, they, they get it because we make an emotion. That's one of the most powerful emotional connections is that story of why you care about what you care about. Now, here's the other total upside. If you're, if you have a well-chosen, well-crafted, well-told origin story, and it's got a little bit of vulnerability in it, right? Like this, this piece of your inner teenager, and I was resisting and resisting, but finally one day I realized like, I, I want to help people. I want to make a difference in the world. And I was willing to get over my inner teenager for that difference that I wanted to make, right? 
there's a little vulnerability, it's personal, right? Now, when you share that story, nine times out of 10, they're going to want to share theirs. And now you get to hear that story of theirs that's like that that you would never have known. And all of a sudden we've got a bond that's so much deeper and we're going to be able to work together better. We're going to be able, they're going to say yes to what you want them to do that. Right. Like, and it's not manipulative if it's authentic, it's what it's how human beings work, love to work, want to work. Right. John, John, how do those CEOs and managers and entrepreneurs, how, how do they react? Because you are, you are asking them to reveal something very personal. That's the first thing. And the second one is you are asking them to focus on just one idea. And as I know, and I've been working with managers and CEOs, they have plenty of ideas that they would like to share. What, what, what are their reactions? You say, be personal and pick one idea. <laughs> what, 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 what is their reaction? Yeah, we we arm wrestle. Uh -huh. you know? um, but, you know, one thing that's really good, Lukash, and, and this is another thing I wish I would have understood better when I was younger. I always got don't believe your own press. Have you all heard that? Don't believe your own press. Okay, well, listen, when you get a company and the New York Times writes an article about you or, you know, the whatever journal and they talk about how incredible you are and brilliant. Okay. That's great, but you still have to change the baby's diapers, right? Like, don't believe your own press. Does that make sense now, Ben? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, but the flip side of don't believe your own press is that if you've got good press, you better well use it, right? So luckily when I go in at this stage, especially now, people know all the other people I've worked with and they don't argue as much anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're just like, oh, I saw that thing you did with Dolph Lundgren. I get it. I want to do that too, even though it's scary. But in the early, early days, I would just have to talk with them and give them some examples and share my own origin story and really walk them through having an epiphany themselves in our conversation about how much that emotional connection matters. And, and then, you know, sometimes I'd still have to arm wrestle them to get them to do it. But, uh, but the thing of it is this stuff is also, um, it's also obvious in hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once, once you know it and look back on it, it's really obvious. In the middle of it, it's not obvious at all. In fact, it's anti-intuitive, counterintuitive. But once you know it, once you hear it, once people hear it, they usually step in and go, oh, yeah, OK, OK, I get it. Right. And then, you know, then the next level, Lukash, is people uh, say they're going to do it, but they resist, <laughs> you know, and they do it a little bit. And that doesn't work. You know, uh, John, you mentioned one word, uh, vulnerability and this is a very, I would say, a very sensitive topic. When I work with managers, they don't want to expose themselves. They yeah. maybe, maybe they have a notion of a manager who who is a, a superhero and knows all the answers and, and and stuff like that, and then they don't want to appear vulnerable. How do yes. you achieve this? What what do you do to make them uh, expose like their weaknesses? So can I tease you for a minute? Yes, of course. Feel okay, free. Because, like, <laughs> Feel free. I'm going to tease all of you. Like, what country are you in? Oh, Slovakia. You mean people don't want to appear vulnerable in Slovakia? Right? I, I mean, I'm sort of teasing because I think uh -huh. Slovakia, um, you know, I understand. I've been there a lot, right? People are a little bit reserved, right? Mm. More than America. We don't want to show our weaknesses to, 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 right. to, to the others. Right. Because showing your weakness is scary. And look at how it's gone in the past for people who like Jesus, Joan of Arc, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Socrates, expose your weakness and right. So it's not just Slovakia, by the way, it's everywhere. It's human beings, right? Some cultures are a little more maybe reserved. Some cultures are a little less reserved, but it's human being. And no one wants to be vulnerable. But I've been coining a term. So 
I would love it if you'd all tweet it out and and give me attribution. You know, I just learned this great term from John Bates. Um, but here it is: insightful vulnerability. Insightful vulnerability. And that comes from a saying by a guy named Les Brown. And he says, people don't connect with your successes. They connect with your messes. Your message is in your mess. Now, it can't just be, here's what's wrong and complain, complain, complain. It's got to be, here's a place where I screwed up, where I had a massive failure. And here's the lesson I learned, the insightful part of insightful vulnerability. So if you look back on your life, I guarantee you there are massive, there are places that you don't want anybody to know about, right? Those things that happened that were so like, look, I lost over $80 million with one company, big words. We raised over $80 million and then we went out of business, failed. I was, you know, I almost died of an autoimmune disease because I was so upset. And what I learned is that my context for my life, the container of my life had been way too small. My context had been something like opportunity only knocks once, you better make it work, right? And listen, by the way, that's a teeny context, especially if you've just failed. Because if opportunity only knocks once, and I think that it, that it only knocks once and I've just failed, well, then I'm done, right? And that's why I almost died. What I realized is that opportunity doesn't only knock once, opportunity keeps knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and don't worry about it, right? Go, go for it, but don't let yourself get stopped by thinking this is the only time I'll ever have a chance to do anything. That's dumb, that's what I did. So I changed the context for my life from opportunity only knocks once to I'm here to make a difference. Succeed, fail, good, bad, whatever i'm here to make a difference and i'm so not i know people who've been stopped by failure like i was i also know people who have been stopped by by success but if my context for my life is i'm here to make a difference neither of them is going to stop me nothing's going to stop me i'm just going to do whatever i can to make a difference so that's what i learned out of losing, I call it my $80 million MBA, you know, and that was one of the, one of the big lessons was what's the context for my life. And I made the context much bigger and my life got much bigger and much more fulfilling. So that's what I call insightful vulnerability, but here's the problem. No one wants to be vulnerable, right? So this is what I call the greatest leadership opportunity in the world. And here's what it is. Nobody wants to go first with insightful vulnerability. But if you go first, everybody else wants to go second or third or fourth mm -hmm. now that you've made it safe, right? So this is the best opportunity for leadership ever because it's something that's extremely worth doing, but everyone's terrified to do it. So if you go first and open the door for everyone, now we've got something very worthwhile and you were the leader that started it M might be even scarier when delivering a presentation comparing to uh one-to-one -one interactions with your employees so maybe it's i would always like to, yeah i would like to ask you when when you work with your clients you either prepare them for a public speech or, or, or a presentation, but do you also mention that you work with like individual clients to improve their communication internally uh, with their employees or within their team? What's the difference in, in what do you do with them? So here's the thing. The funny thing is that, that the difference is there's no difference. That's the difference, right? And in Hollywood, they call it, they say the art is in hiding the art. So here's what the art is in hiding the art is here. Most of you on this call are really good with one-on-one, -on -one, yeah? And I work all the time with executives that are, John, you know, gosh, I don't know what happens to me when I get on stage. I'm really good one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, but when I get up on stage, I just flail and it's terrible. And I say, well, yeah, that's because you think it's different. Stop thinking it's different. The thing that will work the very best for you 
is for you to be just like you are when you're one-on-one -on -one with someone you just love and respect and feel safe with and think and just think the world of. Now, if you can be that way on the stage when there's a hundred people or a thousand or 10,000 people in the audience, you will succeed. The art is in hiding the art. The problem is people think it's different, but it's really not. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, Mario would like to ask a question. Yeah, I would like to go back to the method and theoric part because I really love this topic. I've always been interested in this kind of things, how to be perceived as more charismatic of to be just a better speaker. Yeah. Uh, you basically say that um, the key thing is to create an emotional connection that comes first way before then the logic part, because if you don't get that, the logic part isn't going to go in. So what if I'm, don't know, I'm, I'm part, I'm listening to you, but I'm not binding. I'm not actually connected to what you're saying. The emotion hasn't reached me, maybe because I think that your story is fake. I mean, we've all seen people made up yes, with yes. Up stories, <laughs> yeah. I think, yes. or maybe just that, doesn't seem appealing to me and yeah. the emotion is not there and i'm also feeling like you may be lying or something i'm doubting yeah. about you okay. how do you recover the situation and try to make me feel comfortable and establish a new connection before you can actually get to the logic because in my opinion yeah. it is like switching to the logic part before with failing the first part is not yeah. gonna make any difference yeah so here's the thing First off, number one, and Ivana, will I'll answer your question next, yeah? Um, so uh, number one, if you do this inauthentically, if this is not 100% authentic, people can smell it from 100 miles away, and you will be one of those people that everybody thinks is a fraud and fakes it, and all those stupid freaking stories they make up, blah, 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 right? So the key is, do not ever do that. Do not ever do that. I am not here to help you use this for the dark side of the force. I'm here to help you use this for the light side of the force. And that requires you being 100% real and authentic. Okay. So let's assume that you're doing that and you're still having this issue. Well, now really the issue is over there with them because you're being authentic and they're still being cynical and thinking that you're lying and everything, right? So either number one, they're just not your person, right? Like it very may well be that who it doesn't really matter if you connect with them because they're never gonna be the person you wanna work with anyway, right? That's one possibility. The other possibility is that they want it so bad but they just can't let themselves believe it because they're a little bit cynical because of all the things they've been through in their life, right? So if you're watching their face and you think that there's something there, you know, you could say something like, now look, I've been in the audience when people make up stories too. And I've felt cynical about stuff too. But I want you to know this is 100% true this is what really happened. And if you've got more questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Don't let your cynicism get in the way of, of something that you really care about, right? But I think number one, it starts with being authentic. You cannot, like, I'm just, it'll never work if you're not authentic. Then you'll be one of those people that you were talking about, right? That just everybody's like, oh, right? But here's the thing, I and maybe especially in Slovakia, like I've been there a lot, you know, there's going to be this initial facade of cynicism. You've got to just be willing to smile and be with that and keep going and let them over a little bit of time see that you really are not making this up. It's really who you are, right? But understand that's just people who want to, they want to be with you. They want to believe this wonderful thing, but they've got some cynicism because they've been hurt before, right? So just be kind, be gentle and keep, keep going. Does that, does that land Mario? 
Yeah, it actually does. I also okay. appreciated the example where you say that I'm just putting myself in your shoes and say, yeah. okay, I've been there too. So it does yeah. it for me. Thank yeah. you. Now, here's one other quick thing because you said the word charismatic, I think. I love this definition. We, I'll just toss it out there. You can take it. You know, We don't have to talk about it too long. But what if charisma is nothing more than simply being present with no ulterior motives. I think that's a great place to start, right? Charisma might be even more than that, but God, what a great place to start. What if charisma is nothing more than simply being present with no ulterior motives? Uh -huh. I, I guess that you can't fake charisma. You can't really fake yeah, it. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh -huh. uh, when we were talking about your clients and those those managers and, and public speakers, I guess uh, it might be easier for some and harder for someone else. What about the difference between like extroverts and introverts? What, uh, what, what do you do if you have a person who, let's pretend, is a very, very introverted person and still would like to uh, deliver a great speech? How do you approach that? You know, that's a huge number of the people that I work with. I work with both, but that's a huge percentage of who I work with. And what I like about what I've been able to put together, Lukash, is because I based it all in science, there's a fundamental understanding, almost a formula for how to use these things. And I've even had, uh, I've coached a, a couple of high functioning autistic people. And they told me that the course gave them access to emotional intelligence that they didn't have before because they could just kind of use the formula, right? Not in an inauthentic way, but because they didn't have that innate ability already, right? They could use the things in the course to make those connections and understand why they needed to and everything. And it really made a difference for them. So when, what, I, what I believe about most introverted people is that they tend to be more thought out and, and have more method to their madness, right? Like the extroverts are just madness. The introverts have a method to their madness. So they can use the method in the course, apply it to what they're out to do, and because they're already good at having systems and things, they're, you know, they're, they're very successful with this. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's a real, when on the other side, extroverts, it's very hard for me to, it's not very hard. It's something I can certainly do, but it takes more time for me to teach somebody who doesn't have the ability to be impromptu, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, like you have a great ability to be impromptu, Lucas. You could just put him on a stage and he'll just go, right? Okay, that's that takes more time to learn. That's that's a skill that needs to be developed. So you've got a really big advantage. But I would bet that the place where you are going to fall behind an introvert at first is in preparation. Introverts are used to preparing, right? Now. Here's the best part. When you get somebody who's good on their feet or you train them to be good on their feet and they prepare, that's an unbeatable combination. But I guarantee you there are lots of introverts I've worked with who will crush extroverts who are good at winging it because the introvert's going to prepare as much as they need to. The extrovert's going to try and wing it and that's kind of hit or miss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make so, sense? So, yeah, basically you are... You are uh, describing the difference between like person who tends to improvise a lot but is not able to uh, do the meticulous preparation and the work behind. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that used to be me. That was that was me for m most of my life. Up until I started doing what I'm doing now, that was me. But what I found when I started doing this, I have a good friend who worked with Steve Jobs, directly with Steve Jobs. The, the, a natural communicator, right? The fabulous communicator, Steve Jobs. What I didn't know is that after they created Steve's speeches, which would take months, you know, they would work for those a, a long time, right? 
after they completed the speech, Steve Jobs committed to practicing the speech for an hour for every minute he was going to be on stage. A 45 minute talk, he would practice that for 45 hours. You'd be pretty good. Any of you would be pretty good if you practiced for 45 hours before you got up and did it. That, right? That's obviously not impromptu. <laughs> that's not it. <laughs> but I bet he was really good at impromptu, right? But he resisted the temptation to do that for these talks that really mattered, right? Uh -huh. So that was a big lesson that I learned. Now, we, we, Ivana, we, do you have a question, Ivana? Sorry. No, no. I just want, okay, great. Well, it's good to see you. And anybody else who wants to come on to video, I would love to see you. It makes it way more fun for me. I can't not be on video, but you can. But if you come on video, it's way more fun for all of us. This is also a very good interaction because uh, I've heard that the power of the presentation is all not, not only influenced by the speaker himself or herself, but also by the reactions from the audience. And if you don't see your audience, it's, it's probably much, much harder to deliver an excellent uh, speech. What do you think about it, John? I, I completely agree. Fundamentally, in my world, the meaning of my communication always is the result that it generates. Right. If I say something and I meant something else, but I get this result instead of the result I wanted, that's not their fault. That's my fault. Right. My communication, what I just said means whatever the, the reaction I get is. So I can't blame them. Does that make sense? I say be responsible for what they hear. Now, when I can't see anybody, it is way harder. And I've definitely done a number of these where there was either one person or nobody on that I could see. So what that meant is I had to really get much better at trusting that I communicate well and trusting that my audience gets it. And so when I'm doing that and I can't see anybody, I'm just making stuff up, but I make up that it's going really well because I'm going to show up differently if I think it's going well than if I don't think it's going well. And if, I, if I'm going to you know, base it on how everybody looks when all I see are black squares, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Oh, 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 honestly, this is something that, that's a nightmare for me. Like it speaking, is. It's the hardest speaking thing. to a dark screen makes me feel very, very insecure. I have no idea yes. whether my message is... Uh, yeah. Yeah. whether I'm able to pass it on. So here's the thing, Lucas. I know the feeling, and it's a legitimate feeling, but don't let that feeling win. Here's what you need to know. And everybody on this call would agree. You're a fabulous communicator. People just like hearing you talk. It almost doesn't matter what you say. You're good looking. You're fun. You got great, a great, great voice. So when you're presenting and you can't see anybody, Here's the thing I know about you because you're human and I do it too. You're going to make something up, right? You're going to make something up because you can't see anything. You have no idea really what's happening. So instead of making something up that pulls you down, make something up that lifts you up. You know, trust yourself that you're a fabulous communicator. Imagine everybody on the other side of their screen with their camera off, just loving it and stopping doing the dishes because it's so good. They got to stop doing the dishes and sit down and listen. And right, because, you know, otherwise, why would you make something Usually, up? Yeah, usually I try to convince at least one person, at least one person to, to, to have yes, their me cameras too. on. <laughs> and that's a good thing to do too. That's a good thing to do too. And th this leads me to another question. What about stage fright? How do you, how do you deal with that? If, if, if you have clients who are just too nervous, how, what, what, what do you, what do you uh, recommend? Or do so, you yourself feel it sometimes still? Or are you completely yes. over that? Because, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. No, if I was completely over that, there would be a word for that. Sociopath. <laughs> Yeah. That's someone who, yeah. Right? So yeah. I don't ever want to get over it either. And I'm certainly not over it. So here's some of the best advice I ever got in my life 
about public speaking. But I also think it's some of the best advice I ever got in life about leadership and maybe just being in life in general. And I got the same advice. It was very interesting to me. It's like the universe wanted me to hear it. I got the same advice from two very different sources in almost the same week. One, no kidding, was Snoop Doggy Dog. Not, not back in the day when he was the D-O-double-G dog. And the other one was one of the top leadership coaches in the world. And they both said basically the same thing. So that's probably worth listening to, yeah? So should, should I share it? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Snoop Dogg is a poet. And here's what he said. Snoop Dogg said, don't be nervous. Be at their service. That is freaking brilliant. Don't be nervous. Be at their service. Yeah. Now, the other person, Candace, the leadership coach, she said it differently, but it's the same thing. See what you think. She said, John, when you get up on stage, if you have your attention on yourself, then you have your attention on a minor ball of petty concerns that's of no real interest to anyone but you. <laughs> Ouch. But it's true, right? She said, if, however, you get up on stage and you have your attention on the audience and the difference that you're going to make for them and the difference they're going to make for the people in their lives because of it, well, now you've got your attention on something worth thinking about. Don't be nervous. Be at their service, right? So now here's the thing. That sounds simplistic, I know. But here's what happens. If you've got stage fright at all, here's the only thing you need to do really is notice you're nervous, right? And you've done that before. So now when you notice you're nervous, we just have to add one more thing, which is anytime you notice you're nervous, remind yourself that's about me. Stop being so narcissistic, <laughs> right? Don't, don't make this about me, make this about the audience and the difference I'm here to make. And the minute you shift your, your focus from yourself to the audience, we don't call it nervous anymore, right? When you're focused on yourself, that's nervous. But when you're focused on the audience, this feeling is excitement. It's exactly the same. You may still be sweating. You may still have a little thing in your voice, but it's no longer nervous, it's excited. And if you go out on that stage and you are so excited your voice cracks, but you're focused on the audience, they're gonna love it. But if you go out and you're so focused on you that your voice cracks, everybody's gonna wanna throw up because they're gonna feel just like you and they, they're gonna be nervous and un, right? So if you're focused on yourself and nervous, that's how they'll feel. But if you're focused on them and excited, they'll be focused on you and excited too. Uh -huh. so, so basically what you are saying is not to fight the strong emotion, like I, no. I'm nervous, which is a strong emotion, and I'm not trying to calm down. I'm just like rephrasing the emotion from being nervous to, to being excited. Yes, and you're reframing, you're, you're reframing the, the, that feeling from nervous to excited. And the big key is that happens when you switch your focus from yourself to the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now listen, that really is all there is, you know, on some level. And when you do that, it will totally change your life. But here's the thing, you know, because you said, Lucas, don't fight that emotion. Please don't fight that emotion. Don't think that you shouldn't be scared. You should be scared. Public speaking is dangerous. Jesus, Joan of Arc, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Socrates, right? Look what happened. They got noticed by the group. And so don't do public speaking unless it matters to you more than your fear. But when it matters to you more than your fear, then all there is to do is step through the fear. And that's not called fearless. Fearless just gets you killed. That's called courage. So to have courage and then focus on the audience and just get up and go ahead and be as excited as you are focused on the audience, it'll completely change your experience. Mm -hmm. oh. 
I was, I was this uh, what you're saying is um it, it makes so much sense to me I just want to yes. say that and it's actually beautiful and I think this is what I this is what I I know is like the virtue of detachment and it's such a it's like this this is it and I think it's amazing because it's turning to like it's it's looking at the message rather than the person right yes. it's like yes. it's like when when you look at okay Jesus's message of love love I love thy neighbor rather yeah. than looking at the person of okay I'm going to disagree with yeah. oh they're they're alive or they're not alive or I right, don't I right. believe in them I don't believe in them. it's the message it's always yes. the message that matters so yes. it doesn't matter if you you know what you believe but it's the message and I think that's yeah. that's it you've put it in like a beautiful summary <laughs> good so yeah good. yeah Good. And you know, one of the things I'd offer you, Greta, based on, on what you said about detachment, it's huge, but detachment for a lot of people sounds wrong. Here's what I say. It means the same thing. And detachment to me, I get exactly what you mean. See what you think of this. One of the things that I'm working on this right now, right? Because I've got all this big growth I'm trying to do, and I've got an online course. I want to get 300 entrepreneurs to get in that course by next year. And, you know, so I've got all these things I'm up to and I keep reminding myself I'm committed, but I am not attached. Yeah. Committed, but not attached. Like committed gets you in the car and you go somewhere attached wraps you around the axle. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I have another question. I would like to ask, like, how do you help your clients to deal with failure? Uh, <laughs> from, from time to time, it, it must happen to everyone. Uh, like you want to deliver a, a speech and it, it doesn't turn out that well. How do you help them deal with uh, failure or, 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 or flaws or uh, like yeah. not, not delivering the speech that they really wanted to deliver? Yeah. So... Um, let me see, where did I put that? Um, all right. I don't know where I put this, but there, there, you know, one of the sayings that I love is there, there, there's no such thing as failure. There's just information, right? <laughs> and failure is your information that that didn't work. Right. So now we know that didn't work. Right. And, and there's a few ways that I deal with this. One is you know, I thought when big words went under my $80 million, that was the one that my heart and soul was in the most, you know, and when it went under, I thought I was done. You know, I, I just, I, I went in a corner, I cried, I didn't. And I came across a quote years later that I want to share with you right now. This is the number one quote in my book about failure. There will come a time when you think everything is finished that is the beginning you know i there's not, not a lot more to say than that but that is a brilliant quote from louis lamore who wrote cowboy books you know uh there will come a time when you think everything is finished that is the beginning and if you can orient and it's not easy right it's embarrassing to fail it's all that but if you can orient yourself like that, and in that moment of, ooh, I failed, instead of getting stuck with, I failed, think, wow, well, where did this put me? What is that next thing, right? What is this the beginning of now? Because um, I cried about it, but my friend went and bought all the stuff out of bankruptcy court and recreated bigwords.com as a price search engine. And he was the first person I knew who had a Tesla because he was really successful at it. Meanwhile, I was crying in a corner. I could have done that, but he did it, right? Because I was crying and I thought everything was finished. And he was like, what's this the beginning of? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the other thing is uh, that really helped me out after, because I mean, you know, I had never even conceived of $80 million plus before really, you know, on, that, that I had basically raised with my team. And uh, so I felt so bad about that, you know, but then I remembered again, a couple of years later, it took me too long, but, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I, re I remembered when I was singing in a choir, when I was a very little kid, 
And our teacher said, okay, kids, let's all sing now. And if you're going to make a mistake, just make it loud, right? Because the biggest problem <laughs> was getting us to sing it all, right? Getting us to sing it all. So if you sing it all and you fail, well, that sure beats not singing, right? And when I realized, well, wow, losing $80 million, at least I, at least I was singing loud, you know? And, um, and so, you know, if you never want to fail, then just lay in bed and drink tequila, you know, and watch television. You could mm. probably do that without failing, right? You might die early and you wouldn't accomplish much, but. <laughs> you know. Obviously, we all need to learn how to not be that scared of making mistakes. Obviously. Yes. Yep. John, and, John, yep. we have like one more minute to go. So basically, uh, like your final message, you, you provided us with plenty of inspiration and insights. Yep. Just one final message from you. You know, I, I'm going to focus it on Slovakia, if it's okay, because I love Slovakia. I really do. I miss it. I want to come back. I can't believe it's been so long. And here's what I think when I think about what we've talked about in Slovakia. I think that Slovakian culture, as it is today, is probably a lot more tolerant of failure than it used to be but it's probably still not one of the great failure tolerant cultures on our planet, right? Same thing with vulnerability. Probably not at the top of everybody's list in Slovakia to go out today and be vulnerable, right? So here's what I want you to think about for a minute. If you have the courage to try something where you might fail, but you also might succeed and make a really big difference, I love that. Please do that. Take some risks. Go try something that matters to you. You know, do what you love, not because it's magic, but because what you love is something you'll be willing to do long enough that you can succeed. Right. And then look for places, try it out in safe places first, and then get bolder and bolder to share that insightful vulnerability. Where did you fail? And what was the lesson you learned? right? And then hold that space a little bit longer than you might do so naturally for other people to share their insightful vulnerability. Open that door and hold it open till someone comes through, you know, and, and think of what you can bring to the people around you who are not yet courageous enough to do that, right? But you are. John, this is magic. Last time we had a discussion with this particular group of students and they, they said that they would like our guest speakers to, to give them a task at the end of, of, of the discussion. And, and you just did. Good. Yes, please. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your time. We appreciate it a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Super Can welcome. we have some, some of your um, contact details, social media, something? Yes, 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 please. So there's a few things. Uh, go, go to executivespeakingsuccess.com. And if you want to email us, you can, I'm john at executivespeakingsuccess.com or john at johnbates.com. That's easier. John at johnbates.com. Uh, Go to the website and click on resources and sign up for my free weekly mini training. I make, I go out of my way to make them valuable and they're free. And this will keep your head in the game once a week on Sunday morning. I send that out. And uh, I do have an online course that I mentioned. If you guys want, I think it might still be a little much. It's about a thousand bucks at half price. But I will, if, if you, if anybody wants that, I'll give you a coupon to make it half price. And you can be one of the first entrepreneurs in my new community. And I would love to have you. And it comes with a community. It comes with a monthly ask me anything. It's a thousand bucks, but I tell you, it will make a difference for you for the rest of your freaking whole life. So it's a good investment. And, uh, and I would always be happy to hear from you. Just remind me where, put it in the subject line, met you in Lucas's class or something, and I will get back to you as fast as I can. Happy to connect on LinkedIn too. Did mm -hmm. I miss anything? 
Not uh, one more thing that you also deliver uh, live streams uh, via LinkedIn. So if if people have LinkedIn profiles, they can they can watch your live streams. Yes, follow me and you'll get a notification. I do live streams on a pretty regular basis, and I try to make them fun and valuable. You know, so that's also something. Thank you, Lucas. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank have you so much for your here. time. Thank you're you. welcome. Here. You're super Thank welcome. You. Thank you so have much. Have an awesome life, and I hope to hear from you. <laughs> you too. Thanks. Bye. Take care, John. Have a Bye. nice morning. <laughs>